I'm Bill Conrad, um, President of the Red River Brains Executive Director. But we also have something called the Commonwealth and the National Association of Podcasters, Free of the Speech, which really connects into everything. And it won't take a long time. We've been doing this since we had, we started like in uh, 2014 was the first podcast. We did live stream. We did uh, public and uh, you're trading in the Republican Men's Club had some tremendous uh, number of views on there, and uh, we're just evolving. So the world has evolved in social media side. Need to leave it. Um, before I start, what I want to do, plan to do in the, in the next year, is really work on the first 30 minutes of podcast episodes. So we should put that up. You can listen on your smartphone. It's pretty much the way of the future. It's nice. It also live streams, goes out to a lot of social media. And um, I went to give a little update. I went to the National Association of Podcasts, as we mentioned, with 2,000 people last month. And uh, the average radio listener is 74 years old now, right now, but the average podcast listener is 25, which is really interesting. And the younger people, uh, 25 and under, are just doing TikTok and quick videos. I'm sorry, they could do that. Well, so without further ado, um, with, today we have Melissa Clement from uh, Right to Life. That's how I am. No matter right to life. I've had so many right to life organizations I've worked with. Is this, I used to frequency crisis centers, but in the matter of right to life, it's just very successful. I, um, Melissa does a tremendous amount. Um, she can tell us about her background and history, how it evolved with a small group in the statewide group. We have Jan Hermanson, and she'll be talking about um, measure three and be going first, and of course, Ray is over there. And then um, our commissioner it was supposed to be here today to talk about seven and what's going on at. Um, the county. So if Mike Clark comes in, he'll be here. So without further ado, uh, we're down on the screen so you don't have your PowerPoint, but we have a good podcast going. No. Hi, everybody. I am Janice Erickson, and I am the owner and co founder of the Root Press right here in Reno. We're a publisher, printer, and bookseller. And I'm going to be speaking, I'm also the host of What's the Story, which airs on Tuesdays. Um, from 7 to 9 on 93.7 FM. And then also I live stream from our studio at Wiru from 3 to 5 live. So um, either way, you can either hear the, the replay or you can hear us live on Tuesdays. So the reason that I am here talking about question three it has nothing to do with anything except that I'm a citizen journalist that really gave a darn about question three. And when I heard about it in 2022, I started to do research on it. I attended a lot of meetings. I talked to a lot of people. And I will tell you that I was misinformed for probably the first, uh, what did you say, Nicholas, couple of years? Yeah, at, least uh, at least a year and a half that I was very misinformed, didn't have all the facts that I needed to have. So I kept looking and kept searching and um, and you can correct me, I know there are a couple of people here that know more than I do about this, but what I wanted to do is to point out a couple of facts, one of which is that my grandson, who is 16 years old, said to me, Grandma, they lie. Grandma, they lie on the commercials. And I said, why did you say that? He says, well, I heard you talking about question three, and that it was ranked choice voting pieces, they never talk about that. They only talk about the primaries. They talk about the open primaries. I thought that was a really good idea. He says, and then I heard you talking, and I don't think it's such a good idea now. <laughs> so, so that really pointed out to me one of the things that, that people probably are not really paying attention to. So open primaries, jungle primaries, as they're called, are so that people of all stripes, doesn't matter if you're an independent, a libertarian, a Republican, Democrat, whatever, you can vote in this primary. But wait, can't we do that now? Yeah, we can. So maybe you don't know it, I've talked to people who say, oh, I can't, no, you can't do that. You can't vote for a Democrat if you're a Republican. Well, yes, you can. If you change your party that day, you can go ahead and vote in whatever party you choose. So it's a false narrative for them to say to us that, that these primaries are necessary in order for people to be able to vote for other parties. The other point that I want to make is that when the candidates come in, they can choose to be whatever party that they want to be. So right now, you've got the Republican Party, the Democrat Party, independents, all the different people, and the Libertarians, yes. 
on <laughs> And they, they, they go through the process of how they name their trans guilds. But in the new world, it would be that you can decide you want to be a Republican, and you might be a Democrat normally, but you decide you want an R on that, on that, bill, or on that um, nomination, that's what you're going to pick. So when we go to vote in the primary, you can, you're not going to know if those folks are really the party that they claim to be. The other thing I want to point out, I want, I want you to take a look at the um, State Commission 3 that I passed out. And um, just briefly, um, because these have to be, the way that they write these, they have to be succinct and they have to be a certain number of words. And so they throw it all in, kind of like spaghetti. Shall the Nevada Constitution be amended to allow all, remember, Nevada Constitution be amended, to allow all Nevada voters the right to participate in open primary elections to choose candidates for the general election, which all voters may then rank the remaining candidates by preference for the offices of U.S. Senators, U.S. Representatives, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, State Treasurer, State Controller, Attorney General, and State Legislators. So when you read that, it's kind of mucky, right? Um, it's not clear that you're not doing the ranked choice voting in the primary. At least it wasn't clear to me initially. And other people it was, but for me, I didn't get that at first. You don't do the ranking until you get to the general election. So what happens is that you've got all these candidates that are there, and right now, an independent or a libertarian is very likely to go to the general election automatically or by signature, as I understand it. So that's great. Then they're going to be on the general ballot. In this scenario, if you've got all these folks that are claiming to be whatever they want to be, um, the more popular could very easily be the, the five that get chosen in the climate. So it's just I, I just don't want to play too long on this because I really want to get to how the ranked choice works. But um, I wanted to make sure, I'm going to look at my notes because I want to make sure I don't miss any points, one of which is that don't forget this is changing our Constitution. And this is the second time that we're voting on it. The first time it passed with 53%, we did try to challenge that count, and we got um, snafued uh, by the Department of, or the SOS. Uh, basically, they didn't allow us to get a recount on it. And truthfully, probably even if we did, it would have come out the same because they won't let you hand recount. They make you do a machine recount, which is just silly. So. Um, one of the points is that if we change the state constitution permanently, foster the creation of a one-party system, kind of like Russia and Venezuela, um, and my example is going to show you that. Uh, create a method of voting that no one will be able to challenge the winners, um, and all third parties are going to be disenfranchised because of it. And then state federal, and federal elections will use ranked choice voting, local elections will not. So your ballot might look like um, you know, one race you're going to see, and it's going to say traditional voting. The next race is going to say um, ranked choice voting. And so lots of levels here. I'm not going to get into every aspect of this. I recommend on the, on the uh, document I passed out, there's a couple of um, resources that I added, one of which is uh, nevadapolicy.org. We have a video. Um, also, another one at norcvnv.com and then volunteernevada.com. They all have videos that kind of come out how this all works. I will never cover this all in one 10 minute presentation. But, you have a question? Okay. I'm sorry, bro. I didn't. You want to hold it, questions? Well, this is quite, it's real. I, it's, <laughs> it's right in line with what we want to tell the door. <laughs> so we're going to take questions. Girl, how about that? We love seeing you flexible. It means, it, it, thank you for your explanation and not using it. I've got, but do we see a danger? Let's say this danger. I'm, I'm a, a, a Democrat and I'm against Trump. I switch my goal that day to vote against Trump and go for Nikki Haley or something like that and then switch back to Democrat. You do the danger if we later on if we don't change that. You do that now. Yeah, you can do it now. Yeah. Yeah. There are 42 Democrats. Right, right. Yeah, you can do it now. 
And, and for the ranked choice piece of this, that doesn't have any effect because the presidential race is not included in ranked choice. And that's the confusing part, right? Some of this is, some of it isn't. So, okay, so let's, let's get to, um, can't help, it's really a two-part question, um, though the uh, courts say it's a one-part question. Um, so I want to go on and, and so talk about the jungle primary. Um, let's do an actual vote. Yeah, I think yes, and the answer, then Jake. Okay, we were going to do this up on the screen, but since it's not available to us, we're gonna, I'm going to pass out some paperwork for you. I was prepared for the fact that the electronics might not work. How about that, Phil? <laughs> well, while they're passing this out, um, can we just, we're trying to reformat the two people. And normally a podcast is one, they're doing two. So we'll go ahead and you finish up. We'll have uh, five minutes of questions by sure. this guest to come up, and then Alyssa will come up, and then we'll open it up a round table if anybody has other issues. Um, I've got a question right now for Anna Mountain. So um, does a deep state like this type of voting system? Oh, I forgot to mention that. Thank you for asking. So, yeah, the big money loves ranked choice vote. In fact, the money that's come into Nevada is from all outside sources. I, I imagine there's probably some local as well. But I know that I've heard Wind Resorts donated um, and wanted the ranked choice voting. But for the most part, the money is coming from outside. The Democrats are no one to read. And that's a wonderful thing. And in fact, as a citizen journalist, I am going to be inviting um, to the rep one of the representatives from the Democrat Party to come and talk about that, because I think it's really important that we don't vote against each other. I heard somebody say, oh, well, if the Democrats like it, then I don't. And um, that's not true in this case. So please look at your look at the issue, not just who's voting for it. Um, I believe it is Cortez Masto who said she was against it. Um, I know Sisolak was when it first started out. Um, Amadei is against it. You know, Republicans are against it. Democrats. Did I answer your question, Beth? Yeah, but well, you know, Claire McCaskill, I believe, was the one who benefited in Alaska, and they hid it up there. My son's an Alaskan resident. He's in right. Coast Guard. And um, they, she would not be our senator. We'd have a conservative Republican senator who wasn't for this. The other thing, too, is there appears to be no way to really check the voting. Correct. It's also bureaucratizing. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do our example. I, I, I'd rather not go through this until we talk about it so I can kind of explain how we get to the end part here. Um, you probably already know this. Anyway, all right, so we go to round one, and you've got, um, I thought Gene and Mike were going to be here today, so I included them as our candidates, and then Melissa and Nicholas, because he volunteered. Um, so we have it in round one, and there are no be five, but I, I decided to do four, and you'll probably see why in the end. Um, so we're doing 100 votes. This is not never going to be this easy in the ranked choice voting, it, but this is just symbolic to kind of give you an idea of how it's going to work. So you've got Gene who, get, Gene who gets 45 votes, Mike gets 25, Melissa gets 25, and Nicholas gets five. Well, because, so that's 100 votes and 100% of the votes, but because Nicholas only has five, he's eliminated, all right? So he got those five votes, and what happens to that, those people's ballot is that they go to their second choice, okay? So whereas our second choice, hey, nightmare is hard, and pass them to the appropriate candidate. So if you turn to the next page and go to round two, and this could go on for a while, and could also take a while to count. Um, my understanding is there are places that it's taken weeks to count this, and then there have been challenges, and in those challenges they found, oh, oops, that wasn't who really won. So um, not real full break. Um, so the five ballots get distributed. In this case, Nicholas's five ballots, their second choice, all went to Melissa. They loved you, Melissa. <laughs> so Melissa ends up with 30. Mike now has 25. Gene has 45. So guess what? Now Mike's eliminated. And again, this is super simplistic, everybody. This is not, you know, that they're going to do this by machine. This is not going to be this easy. But for, for uh, exact purposes, that's what we got. So Mike is now eliminated, and Mike just walked in the door. Hey, Mike, you just got eliminated. <laughs> Sorry. 
All right, so his 25 ballots go to their second choice and pass them to the appropriate candidate. So he's got 25 votes hanging out, they pick their second choice, and oh look, they picked five for G, and 20 for Melissa. Look at Melissa, she's now up to 50. She started at 25, she's now at 50. So G has 50 and she has 50, so the wins. Who wins that race? Well, you look at the next page. Yes, it's crazy. They draw a box. There's no round. They actually draw Draw lumps. So it's draw. Yeah. So it gets a, and I really wanted to keep it simple. Again, it's much more complicated than this. The example is very representative of what's going to go on inside a machine that you cannot tell how it's programmed. You can't question any of that. It's no different than it is now. And so you're really set up for who knows who's going to really win. And the, the different trials that I've seen done by different people that have, you know, kind of tried to mock this up, it seems like the third, the middle candidate seems to always win. And, and look at this. Sorry, Melissa, but it took three times before she caught up, even close to where Gene was at the very beginning. So, uh, you know, you have to question why would it take that? Plus, those folks are getting more votes than you are. If you voted for Gene, you never got a second chance. The other folks got a second and sometimes a third vote, right? So, very um, questionable, I guess, is what I would say. Question three is questionable. All right. So, <laughs> Um, that, those are the, the, quote, high points, um, and I just would recommend, I, I've been looking at this for so long, and, and I just, I, on my show, every week I tell people, no one three of I, I want you to investigate it, I don't like to tell people what to do, but in this particular case, I'm telling you what to do. <laughs> it's rare. Listen to my show and you'll know. It's rare that I tell you what to do. I try to give you both sides. And actually I did. I had a guy from Ballot Media on and he, he represented both sides. But I will say to you that it was hard for him to give the argument for the pro rank choice. Um, it, it was very difficult for him. So um, I, I just, you know, I, I'm welcome questions. If you want to do those now, Bill, or if you want to wait. Let, let, let's hold and have uh, Melissa speak for uh, five to seven minutes and Mike speak five to seven minutes. Uh, uh, open board, you can ask anybody questions. Excellent. Well, had I won, I would have been voting for ranked choice voting, but since I did not, I will not. Um, my name is Melissa Clement, and I'm looking about a right to life. I um, advocate for life from a conception to natural death. Um, I'm there are lots of service organizations like the Crisis Pregnancy Centers who do heroic work helping women every single day. My job is kind of like the Air Force for those folks. Um, I, I, I take the long, the long view, and so I'm, I'm in the education sphere and I'm very much in the political sphere. So I lobby 120 days every other year. And, um, and so, I, I, you know, and I'm not I'm not the most boastful person, but I think there's probably nobody in the state of Nevada that understands question six like I do, just because I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, I am going to go through a very fast presentation. Uh, this could be 30 minutes, it can be 10 minutes, but I'm going to do it in five to seven. Um, question six is about abortion, so it's important to, to start with the very basic facts of what is abortion. Abortion is the willful destruction of a living and newborn baby in her mother's womb. Abortion is not miscarriage care. It's not a top of, uh, pregnancy treatment. And it really, really, really shouldn't be birth control. We need to, you know, why are we talking about this? This is my first question. Why are we even discussing question six? Because in Nevada, abortion is available for any reason or no reason up to 24 weeks, which is six months. Any reason or no reason, up to six months. The only requirement is it must be done by a licensed physician. After 24 weeks, in the case where a woman is facing a health or life challenge, she can still get an abortion. It just must be done in a licensed hospital with a licensed physician. 
And that, for a very important reason, because as a woman goes further into her pregnancy, it is more risky for her to get a, a, get an abortion because it, it goes from simpler procedures to actually, and I'm sorry to say this, but dismembering that baby piece by piece and pulling those pieces out and making sure those pieces are, are, are out of the womb. It's also in Nevada, we are actually a fairly humane people, and we, a long time ago, decided that a baby that is born alive in, a, in an abortion deserves the very basic humane treatment of life-saving medical care, and that cannot happen outside of a hospital. So that, that's the basis of our law. It's NRS 442.250, and it was subject to referenda in 1990. And it won, you know, and a referendum is basically a ballot question where everybody says, I like this law or I don't like this law. If I don't like this law and that wins, then that, that law is removed from a uh, statute. If, I, if it wins, like this particular NRS won, that means it can never be changed except by a vote of the people. So no legislature, no legislator, no U.S. senator, no governor, no county commissioner, nobody can change the basis of 24 weeks. No one. And it, it takes, like I said, a vote of the people. And so, so now we have a vote of the people in question six. I myself, I'm very pro-life. Every life is sacred. Every life is a um, endless possibility that is, and, and it is our greatest human capital and potential. So that's me, and I'm super pro-life. And I'm just going to stop and think about that. Yes, I am very pro-life. I, I just completely lost the plot. Um, so this particular law is extreme, in my opinion, because at six months, where we, where we have decided viability as to that baby is, um, is pretty far along. That baby is kicking, that baby is moving, that baby can live outside the womb with a little extra time in an incubator. We're talking a living, breathing, little tiny Nevada. And so I think six months is a little too far, a lot too far. Um, but you know, unfortunately, Nevada was for reproductive freedom, the Democrat Party, Jackie Rosen, and um, however you say her first name, Harris, have all decided that's not far enough. And so they have, they have presented question six. And it is a, and this will amend our constitution. And I'm gonna read just a little bit of, of the um, amendment. All individuals shall have a fundamental right to abortion performed or administered by a qualified healthcare practitioner until fetal viability or when needed to protect the life or health. Now, I'm gonna just stop right there for one second. The health of the mother. The life of the mother is, we all understand that. Mom is, um, has got a condition where um, her life is threatened. She may die if, if something doesn't happen. The health of the mother is something completely different. And that was, that was decided back in the 70s, along with Roe v. Wade. The health of the mother could be anything, and it can be transitory. It can be, um, it can be physical, it can be mental, it can be financial. So I'm having a bad fair day. I don't have money in my checkbook. Uh, that can be a reason to, to get an abortion. Now, I'm not saying that that's always the case, but you just need to understand that that is a pretty big loophole. Um, life or health of the pregnant patient without interference from the state or its political subdivisions. Again, I've got to stop for a second. You know what's not listed in this question? couple of very important words, mother, woman, girl, female, that none of that is in question six, which, you know, actually makes a lot of sense because question six does not help women, but I'm just, uh, illegal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, without interference from state or political subdivisions. So that means that a legislature or a county commission cannot come in and say, we require a level of, of health and safety and sanitary conditions for any location that's going to provide abortions. Because this is a fundamental right. So you can't, 
you can't do things that are going to cause that fundamental right to be delayed in any way. Um, uh, let's see. I, now I could read a little bit more, but the one thing this is the this is the big deal. Fetal viability means point in pregnancy when, in the professional judgment of the patient's treating healthcare practitioner, we're going to get back to that word in a second. There is a significant likelihood of the fetus sustained survival outside the uterus without the application of extraordinary medical measures. Now, I have three kids, and my oldest was born with the with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. He had to be he had to be taken out of me and rushed down to um, the ICU, and they had to work on it for a little bit. Now, you wouldn't know that at 29. You wouldn't know that. Um, that's extraordinary medical measures, but you know what else is? That little grain squishy bowl that they put with the side a child's nose or down their throat if they happen to ingest meconium or something like that. There will be no requirement for a hospital for a late-term abortion after this amendment goes in. So therefore, the level of fetal viability or what, what this defines fetal viability is a much higher standard in a hospital than it is in a back alley abortion location. So on um, healthcare practitioner, as I mentioned, doctor is required currently. Healthcare practitioner is the new term. And that is a term that is defined in the matter of by statute as a whole lot of things. Some of which are licensed nurse, dentist, optometrist, um, doctor of oriental medicine, or other person whose principal occupation is the provision of services for health. That can be a lot of things and a lot of a lot of which are not going to have the level of um, training as a, as a trained open GYN. I think women deserve at least that. Question six, the question we will see on your ballot, um, should the Nevada Constitution, and it goes, it goes on and on. It's fairly clear. It's fairly clear we're talking about abortion. It's fairly clear healthcare professionals write a warrant. And the last eight words or six words, at any point in the pregnancy, so, I mean, you just need, people need to read the question, maybe read the amendment, and really there's no other vote except no. Um, and then I'm at uh, one more slide, and then I, I, I won't, I'll, I'll quit to uh, bore you guys to death. What are the effects of question six? If I vote no. If I vote no, the current law remains, which means abortion is available up to six months for any reason or no reason. It must be done by a licensed physician. Parental involvement can be required. I didn't, I didn't dis, uh, discuss that, but that's a very big point. Parental involvement can be required. I think an underage girl at 12, 13 years old should have to have a parent at least notified, if not provide consent, before she gets a, a medical procedure that could impact her for the rest of her life. That could be that, could be that she might be dragged to by a child sex trafficker to hide his crimes. So I think that's important. Health and safety regulations remain intact, intact. And here's the important thing. No woman is punished for an abortion currently, ever. None, not at all. If question six passes, third um, what we're actually voting on is we're trying to muster abortions up to birth for any reason or no reason. Um, anybody and everybody can pretty much do it. No parental involvement ever. That closes the door. State and local government cannot regulate for health and safety, and women are punished by unqualified practitioners in unsanitary locations, and they have no, no ability to, to ask for anything. 84% um, of people don't know what our law is currently. Over 70% would like to see abortions contained to the first trimester or less, but if this vote happens any time, <laughs> This vote, the, when this vote happens, we're going to get slaughtered, absolutely slaughtered. Now, the only piece of good news is that this is the first cut that's on the ballot, and we have another a second time. But, you know, I am praying for a miracle, and that miracle begins with each and every one of you, that I need you to be the foot soldiers. You have to be um, educated on this. You have to take the word out to everybody in your, in your network, because... I don't care if you're pro-life or you're pro-choice. I think we all should be pro-woman. And question six is anti-woman, anti-girl. And it's deadly for the nearly born baby. 
Thank you, Melissa. We're going to go ahead to Mike now. Mike, can you hold it? I'm going to time you eight minutes, and we're going to have questions. Can you do it in eight minutes? Sure. Stay food thinks he can do it in eight minutes, Mike. <laughs> okay, this. Just do it bit. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Clark, Washington County Commissioner, and I'm here to talk about elections and uh, it's been, uh, you know, just an ongoing issue with this county. It's been, uh, we've had more mischief and more things go wrong in the last four or five years than we've had since this county's inception. This county's been incorporated since 1861. It seems like we have more problems in the last uh, four or five years, and, and I'm going to attribute that to people that don't know what they're doing or they know what they're doing and it isn't in, in, uh, in good service to the citizens. So we've got a long-standing problem that we're on our third or fourth registrar of voters in the last uh, five years. Each and every one of them, has, uh, they never talk to us. It isn't, we're not hearing from them. The public isn't hearing from them. We're hearing from the county manager's office. We're hearing from their uh, public information office. Uh, if you remember when uh, Dina Spicula was there two uh, two weeks ago, the Charles voters ago, the uh, the public information officer for the county was answering questions for the registrar voters office. I'm, I'm a former county assessor. I never had the county spokesperson speak for me. I speak for for the office. So we've got a situation here where. We haven't seen one single county commissioner resign due to stress. We haven't seen the sheriff resign due to stress. We haven't seen any elected official resign for, uh, due to stress. Why is it that we continue to have somebody under the manager's office continues to resign under duress? Then I'm, I'm, I'm feeling beat up. I, I can't do my job. Um, you know, and they always use this excuse. Well, when, when are we going to realize that this is a lame excuse? You know, everybody needs to be outraged. Here we are right before one of the most contentious elections of our lifetime nationally, and then locally we've got a situation, and, and, uh, and somebody is quitting because of stress. Well, you can use the word stress all day long, but I would like to have these ladies interviewed and find out what really is happening, because... The illusion is from the manager's office that they're, they're resigning because of stress from us, the public. And I don't believe that to be true at all. I think that they're resigning under stress from the management, people that they have to answer to. And you folks, and that's my opinion, I don't know why he always uses this excuse. It's a very tired excuse. Oh, they had to leave because they were, they were stressed out. For years, this county talked about election workers being threatened and, and uh, they were worried and they were uns felt uh, unsafe. So I asked for public records a few months ago and it took me several months to get them. But lo and behold, there wasn't one single complaint to the sheriff. There wasn't one single complaint to HR. There wasn't one single complaint to Reno PD. There wasn't one single complaint to uh, HR, the sheriff, the police, HR, to the uh, private security firm. There isn't a written complaint by anybody whatsoever. So the county can't hide behind that lame, lame excuse anymore that you folks have intimidated the workers. You know, that's that, and that this is what their go-to cover story is. It's a phoning story. This person, in my opinion, didn't want to uh, play ball with the, uh, with the powers that be and was forced out right before a major election. We've got a county manager who's never run an election before in his life until he came to this county, and he's never run an efficient or, or, uh, election in this county. There's constant problems every single time. You know, if you gave... You know, I'd like to run a, I'd, I'd like to be the captain of a, yeah, of an aircraft carrier. But if I was, I'd probably crash it. You know, I'd probably, I'd probably ruin it. And, and we've got somebody who doesn't know what they're doing in charge. 
and then they hire the people that, that answer to them, and we've got the blind leading the blind, and we've got a mess here. Uh, next, I want to talk about the county freely admitted, and I've always talked about uh, uh, cleaning up the, uh, the, uh, the rolls, the voting rolls. Counties for five years that they don't want to do that. We finally had somebody making an attempt to clean up the voting rolls. They sent out cards before this last one you got from the Secretary of State. And that really irritated the county management. They didn't like that. They thought she was she wasn't staying in her lane. She, she was in her lane, but they that wasn't the lane they wanted her to be in. So trying to clean up the voter rolls, but we had 26,000 that we know about ballots that were returned, like a primary election. Think about that. We've only got a couple hundred thousand people voted. We probably had 10% error factor right there. And that's just the ones that got returned. I know if something comes to my house and, and I don't recognize the neighbor's name, I just throw it in the trash. So I'm thinking there was probably double that number. There was probably 50,000 ballots that went out. I'm not saying these were made, made up names, but they, they, there were names on these ballots, there were addresses on these ballots, and the county didn't do their due diligence and track down why 26 that we know of, but probably 50 if we knew the full truth, 26,000 voters were disenfranchised. You know, they always want to try and they, meaning the, the uh, elected officials now, the, the government that we have, the U.S. government, uh, the state government, the local government, always want to blame the, uh, the uh, uh, right wing for trying to disenfranchise people. Well, you're making it harder to vote. If you have to have an ID, you're making it harder to vote. If we don't have early voting, you're making it harder to vote. They come up with all these lame excuses, and yet... To, to make more people vote, to help more people vote. And we only had less than, right around 20% of, of the eligible voters voted in the primary. So everything they're doing to increase voting is, is not working. And we have these contested uh, elections that people are, are not believing what's taking place there. And we've got incompetent management who keeps, you know, in, in essence, firing the registrar of voters, and then using the excuse that it, they're, they're being asked to leave because they're asking to leave because they're under such tremendous stress. I'm just making this stuff up. There's a massive lawsuit, and it isn't just the registrar of voters. There's five or six different department heads in the recent times, the last year or two, that have all been pushed out by the manager's office. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big lawsuit now. Amber Howell is the lady's name. She used to run all the homeless uh, uh, issues, and, and somehow or another she got sideways with the manager, and she was again forced out. So she's got a massive lawsuit against the county, alleging everything that I'm uh, alluding to in this talk, and, she's, and, and that's, on, that's not even the registrar of voters, but this is their MO. They, they use the stress card and force people out who aren't playing ball and aren't on the team. So that, that's what you need to hear. Uh, Marsha Burt Bigler, former county commissioner, is here, and I was hoping to have a couple of comments here, but it looks like she's out of here. Uh, so, you know, this is this is somebody who's got some institutional knowledge. Go ahead about about what's taking place here. Marsha, have and you had eight years on the county commission before me? Have you ever seen this type of a mischief ever on, on your term? Never. And I'll tell you, I have been in politics all of my life. I grew up in politics, and I've been in politics in Nevada since probably somewhere. I started lobbying full-time for legislature in 1983, and I worked in politics long before that time. I worked on Barbara Vikanovich's campaigns. I worked on Jen Gibbons' campaigns. I had never, ever seen this kind of criminal behavior. And I can't call it anything but criminal behavior. It is simply criminal to destroy the career of professional women just because they will not toe the mark or do whatever it is you want to do. And trust me, whether I win or lose this election, I will address this issue. I have already begun that process. 
This is wrong. It is wrong to the citizens in Washoe County, but it's also wrong to those women who will never be employed in the career of their choice again in the state of the bath. Never. And any of the other comments that I made, do you agree or disagree? Am I on the right track on my, uh, my observations? I, I totally agree with everything that you have said. And I, I want, for those of you who don't know, Harry Brown is here because of me. I freely admit that. I was commissioner. The, the, John Slaughter decided to step down. The uh, headhunter that the county hunger um, came to each of the commissioners and said, what do you want? Do you know anybody in this? And I knew three people, and I called all three of them. Uh, people like Eric Brown happened to be one of those people. He came. He, Mike and I took him around, and Mike was wonderful. He introduced him to all of the party heads, I mean the commission department heads. We thought he was really going to play a straight game with us. I don't know who this man is. I will tell you very frankly, I knew him for years. I do not know who this man is. He is not the same person that I worked with. And his complete lack of concern about his employees, that he would allow this to happen to three women who he basically, in this last case, he basically told her point blank, Either you step down for stress and you don't have a job. Oh. That's right. Oh. And I assure you, if I'm elected, Mike and I are going to fix this crime game immediately. So you've got two insiders, your eyes and ears, telling you the truth about what's taking place there. The county commission at this point in time has three votes and support Eric Brown and everything he does. This is quid pro quo textbook. He helps these three commissioners out, and they help him out with pay raises and whatever else he wants. So we've only got one chance in this coming election to sort out and straighten out this county, and that's March for Berkbinger for commission for commissioner. Yeah. And we did have, uh, we did Marcia on that board then we'll have the three to two votes, and we'll be able to do some things that make sense and, and actually help the people. So that's, you know, the summary of what I was talking about at the end of the day. How can we fix this? We've got a chance to fix this in a very short period of time. So even if you don't live in that district, if you know anybody who lives in that district, if you can put up a yard sign, even if you're not in your district, reach out to Marsha. I mean, let's see if we can get a change of uh, leadership on the county board of commissions and a lot of things that are haywire can be fixed. So again, it's all back to the registrar of voters. Uh, these people are, are, they've been a stranglehold on this county. Uh, Claire and Andreola was uh, supposedly at, uh, registered as a Republican, votes with these ultra, ultra liberal two people, the, the chair and her were first wingman there, about 95, 98% of the time. I mean, just lockstep, and they they prop up Brown, the manager, and Brown props them up, and you get what you get. You've got the situation where it isn't just the registrar of voters being forced out, it's other department heads who don't want to play patty cake with the management. So I'm just telling you what I see, and if not, if this, uh, we can't get a change of regime here, we're going to have another four years, and it's just Clara just got another four years, and the commissioner Hill gets another four years, God help you. Thank you. So, so thank you, Mike. I'm going to, uh, we're going to open up to questions. You can keep them really short in one line. I'm going to ask the first one. Reference for the panel, uh, and you can all tune in, but it's a polarized issue. So Melissa's probably there. I want to know about um, the uh, Planned Parenthood, support about the gun fire. Do they actually do abortions, and or do they affirm out? And what happens to the, the fetals after they abort? The fetal, the, the babies after they abort? That is a, that is a case by case um, basis. In in Reno, up until about six months ago, um, the Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood in town only did uh, chemical abortions, which is a, a, a two pill thing um, that that they distribute out of the office. Um, but about six months ago, they opened the new uh, facility that's huge on Longley and Huffaker. Um, in South Virginia, 
And it does, it does, abort, they do abortions, definitely do abortions. And they make a lot of money doing it. It's, in fact, Planned Parenthood is the number one abortion provider in the country. Mm -hmm. As well as the number one uh, um, provider of cross gendered hormones. So, yeah, so not good. Well, thanks. And Mike, I'm going to let the uh, speakers, anybody wants to ask a question, just come up yeah. and stick them up. You like your though. Oh my. Go ahead. Ray, do you have a question? All this, whether it be right or right, from my transfer or them, is very misled, I said. Very misled. If you watch TV on the voting, you know, the uh, rank choice voting. Ask the last the red to how screwed up it is. I have had a speaker a few months ago in rank choice of voting the poetry app. I still can't get it clear. And if I, maybe I'm not a brilliant scientist, but if I can get it, most people will be so damn confused. And the Democrats love this because they feel they can consult them. So what do we know about, that's true about ranked choice, just so no, don't know against ranked choice. Real quick, going on, one last question, 10 second answer before we go up. What do you think about parents last line? Fuck. Okay, I think she totally nailed it. I was doing commentary with my mom and uh, he just was very fluid and was very spot on. And one of the things I wish she would have said to Walt when is, Oh, you guys know what a woman is now? Because you didn't about a year ago. You didn't know what a woman is. And now you want to talk about all women's rights. So I think JD did a solid last night. I think it was really apparent to the American people who were watching. Just he was on the link. He talked about all the issues, how they try to deny things or twist the words or make it not what it seems. Um, I'm really glad that Melissa's here to expose a lot of this because they do it in such a way, they word it in such a way, and I said this at a meeting about a month ago, I said, you know, they make it sound so sexy in a way. Women's reproductive rights, what well, doesn't sound wrong about that, right? I'm a woman, you're a woman. Oh gosh, yeah, I want my health rights. Like, what, what does that mean? But how they do it is so wrong. So I think J.D. Vance did us good. Um, I just can't wait, that's my call. All right, I got a number of things out of the honor. Uh, What's that? Oh, Nicholas St. John with the Watch Up Patriots. Um, one of the things that she'll say, these first start with uh, ranked choice voting. And in Oakland, for those of you who don't know, they had ranked choice voting and they essentially elected the wrong guy. So a guy complained about it. They reached out of them and amazingly, that guy now won. There's no way to check this stuff, guys. It's not transparent. Second of all, there's going to be a debate on News Channel 4, Box 11, on 10 15 um, about ranked place voting. Interestingly enough, all four people they have are progressives. So it's progressive on the against side and progressive on the first side. Uh, so, anyway, it'll be interesting. I've written into them. Um, I'm trying to get a meeting with one of them on the against side about some stuff. And third, um, um, Janice covered this, but I want to reiterate, um, ranked choice voting lets people who made the worst choice out of the five vote a second time. <laughs> Nobody should be able to vote twice. So if you want to talk to someone trying to keep them not confused, just tell them this lets some people vote twice. Nobody's in favor of that. But If I could just add, um, Alaska is probably as got an initiative on the ballot to um, repeal ranked choice voting. So they've had it since I believe it was 2022, and um, they already have it on there to, to repeal it. Because everybody always references, oh, Alaska does it, Maine does it. Yeah, but Alaska doesn't like it. If I could just add to that, Alaska, that's not a constitutional amendment, so they can change it pretty quickly. It will take us how many years to change this? Oh my gosh, five years. Five weeks we have to before we can change this. But what's happening is if you go on day rate, 
they make him with veterans and everybody and and the young people that you can vote with rank. You right, them most, like, my, like my grandson, yeah. Most misleading man, don't tell your neighbors and such. And Mike, you were right on your stuff. We have a so-so, is he supposed to be the county manager? I don't think there's anything so-so about him. So-so would be giving the benefit of the doubt uh, the, the guy is incompetent as far as running elections, in my opinion. And that's just based on the facts of what we've seen and the people he continues to choose. He chooses people who don't know. It's the blind leading the blind. We've got somebody in charge of the department who hires people who don't know what they're doing, and then we get the mess that we have. And then if they don't uh, toward the line, as um, former Commissioner Blake Bigler says, then they get pressured by What's taking place at the county? May I ask a question about that, Mike? Sure. So if, is Eric your employee? Is he reporting to you and the commissioners? He reports to the three commissioners who support him. He doesn't report to me. I can okay. assure you of that. Well, I, I understand that. But that is the role, correct? He's, yeah. he, he, reports. He, works, he works for the commissioners. So if you've got two ultra liberals plus a... Uh, uh, so-called Republican who votes with them. It's a three to two vote on, on everything we do of any importance. Whatever they want to do, he supports. And whatever he wants to do, they support. And so at the end of the day, four people run this county, the manager and three commissioners, and they're running, uh, they're, they're making 500,000 citizens uh, comply with their wishes. I don't think it's right. If I may, yeah. um, if HR, right, if HR. It takes one more vote. That's what No, it if takes. HR had information, that's okay. No, if HR had information that was factual that showed that he was either um, going after these gals or whatever, somehow uh, coercing them to, because I've, I've experienced similar types of things in different jobs. Sure. Um, what options might you have? There are no options. The only option is getting another reasonable voice on the commission. And here's why. The people at the HR department, there's 31 different departments in the county. The manager oversees all of their budgets. The manager oversees everything. Talk about, uh, talk about uh, somebody totally in charge of what's taking place. Uh, we've got three votes that support anything he wants to do. The HR department uh, is is in lockstep with, with what's going on. Their job is on the line. Talk about a conflict of interest. This is outrageous. We've got three commissioners who back up the manager. The manager controls everybody's budget, including the elected officials, even the other elected officials. I'm talking, there's seven elected officials in this county, plus the commissioners. It's the sheriff. It's the DA. It's the public administrator. It's the clerk. It's the assessor. It's the treasurer. All of these folks are elected, but they still have, have to comply with the manager oversees all of their budgets. Follow the money, folks. That's, that's what this is about. Parker going after the sir. That's obvious. He's going after us. I don't know anything about that. I'm trying to say, people ask me how to get it fixed, and how the way to get it fixed is get a reasonable other vote on the commission. And other than that, you got what you got. It's a lockstep situation. They always vote in. Just watch the county commission meetings. You don't see these three other commissioners ever deviating from each other. Do you? Anybody no, goes no. to meetings a lot? <laughs> no, they're, they're lockstep. It's okay. Uh, Melissa, I have a question uh, for you. Could, so you said there's no restriction on what the state can do on this. But I have a question. The county commission could, could they do an informed consent? So I have three, two things. Inform, could they do informed consent? Because that's not in this bill, right? No, they could not. Because it, um, this is a constitutional amendment. So every past law that we have or current law that we have on abortion and any future law would have to fit within this. And um, informed consent in, in Michigan, which had a similar 
uh, fell because it is a an obstacle. Now, the county commission would have no ability to provide um, provide any regulation either because it specifically says no state or local uh, jurisdiction can, um, uh, let's see, it can, can regulate. Let me, let me get the, um, uh, without interference from state or from the state or its political subdivisions, which would also include schools. And that's particularly bad when you think about um, like the Democratic Na National Convention recently, they had a, a mobile abortion ban pull up and give free abortions and vasectomies. Um, the state and local governments would not be able to regulate the location of, of these things. So it's foreseeable that you could see the same kind of situation happen in front of our junior highs and high schools. So this will be the last question and then you can talk afterward. This is the last question. So if you want to ask any more questions, just come up after the, uh, the luncheon and um, I'll be, I'm trying to get everybody out by one o'clock so you can just, we get people in and out. This is more like an observation, but a question. And I think everybody needs to be aware of this. I've been involved in the election since 2022 doing whatever needs to be done, get involved instead of, you know, instead of sitting at home complaining. And this is to Mike Clark. What I'm seeing is the state taking over our elections. They're centralizing. I came from purchasing with corporations, and as soon as they centralized, you lost control. These are our voices. It's our First Amendment right. I don't like sitting back and watching them take away my First Amendment right. They're making it silent right in front of us. I think that has a lot to do with what we're seeing. This new VRAM that everybody, that, well, some of the commissioners bragged about, praised, we have no control locally anymore. I have friends that cannot change their status. And then if they try, it's frustrating. We have people that moved away years ago that are still on the rolls and they can't seem to get it done. You're gonna have to go to the state level and keep your fingers crossed. It's easier to have local control. Is that true? Am I observing correctly? That's what's question. Thank you. The problem that we have is this is uh, all controlled by Car the folks in Carson City. The, the local commissioners have no say in this, but we're, we're certainly playing right into the state's hands. The state is controlled by uh, liberal Democrats, and uh, this is the way they want. They, they can outvote us. It's, and I, I talk about it as it's always a three to two vote on the county commission, and it's always the same kind of a situation down in Carson City when the legislators meet again next February, I believe it is, for their 120 days of uh, God knows why. But uh, to your point, this, this is going to be controlled by the state. The local folks can't seem to control it. I don't have a lot of faith in what the, what the state's going to do, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of out of our hands at this point in time. So, in closing, I'm going to have Bob Devin. He's here today. No one three also, and um, Ray, take it away after Bob on. And uh, thanks for everybody coming. Just to, uh, one admin announcement: we have a dinner next month. It's scheduled for um, the seventh, which is two days after the election. It may or may not get postponed. Um, we'll have that information out shortly. So go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I have a call in. I have a call in to the Atlantis and the Megan Bart that'll be the host. If it would work out to do um, Wednesday the 13th, they give us a little bit more time. But that's not firm. Right now, the seventh is firm. Yeah. And it'll be a panel where she'll have a panel of and the theme is going to be happy, Republic, uh, the election, Republicans happy, so-so, or sad. Hopefully, it'll be happy. But that's going to be the theme. And it'll be at the Atlantis, regardless of the day. And it'll be at dinner. Good luck. Well, uh, thanks, Ray, for, the, for those information. Commissioner Clark, Melissa. Ray, thanks for letting me speak for a moment. Uh, I'm one of the chairs for the uh, No on Three Committee. Uh, we're doing pretty good. We've got a lot of radio ads. Uh, we're looking for some more money for our Spanish stations. We've got 
uh, Monica Lehman, who's our Spanish-speaking lady who's doing commercials on the Spanish radio. Uh, we have Tony Grady doing uh, radio ads on KKOH, KFFT. Uh, if anybody would like a sign, I brought some extra signs here. I have handouts in the back there if you'd like to take some. I've been handing out my little business card. Uh, that is a really kind of a nice way. If anybody would like to give those to your son, there's about a thousand of them sitting over at the Washoe County GOP office north of the uh, of Lannis there. And uh, I do appreciate uh, what Commissioner Clark has been trying to do. Uh, he has been stymied at every level. Uh, Alexis Hill has shouted him down in the middle of a sentence. He's, she's been absolutely horrid. She reminds me of the Bolsheviks that took over Russia. And that's their game plan, to shut people out. And I'm glad that we've got Mike here to speak up for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One last comment from me is, if you get an opportunity to come to the county commission meeting, let's ask the county what happened to these 26,000 ballots that got returned. These, these weren't made up names. These were real people that didn't get a chance to vote. 26,000 voters could have changed a lot of elections. I don't know if there were, a, I don't know what their political affiliation was, but 26,000 people got disenfranchised because of the incompetence of Washoe County's management. It's as simple as that. We should stick up for the folks who didn't have their voices heard. They might have been, uh, their address was wrong. They might have moved. Nobody followed up. Uh, to say nothing of wasting $90,000 of taxpayer money on postage and printing on 25,000, 26,000 ballots of one out. So that's the question. How come the county disenfranchised 26,000 people? How come they got returned? Did they know something? Did they know how these people were going to vote and they changed their address or made their uh, made their uh, undeliverable? Good question. Thank you. Hey, hey Mike, did you also see uh, yesterday I saw an article that the ACLU filed a petition to block all of the um, voter cleanup. They actually filed a petition in, in court. And so it's it's a continuum of them not wanting to do their job. Well, you know, we've got clean uh, assessor roles. We've got clean treasurer roles. I guarantee the treasurer, if you owe Washoe County any money, they know exactly where you live. You could be living in Timbuktu. If that's where your tax bill gets sent, they'll find you. So they they want certain roles clean, but they this one is just a mess. I mean, it's foundationally, it's, it's, uh, it's a mess. Terrible.